And now we take you to Evangel Assembly of God in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. We're in a series of, of, of messages called Focusing on the Important. How many of you realize that at the beginning of the year, that's very, very important? We're focusing on the important. Today, I want to talk to you about the Good Shepherd, Psalms 23. Verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Would you say that with me? He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Turn to somebody and say, God is with me. Come on, tell them. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. See, the Bible never says come to Jesus and you'll never have enemies. The Bible just says come to the Lord and he'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And and I'll tell you, your enemies will get so fearful, they'll be afraid to even slander you or talking against you because you've got two good big angels named goodness and mercy. Standing right behind you, amen? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell, I will live, I will abide in the house of the Lord forever. How many of you realize that in the New Testament, when you get born again, your body becomes the house of the Lord? Your body becomes the temple of the Lord. Now, most Christians that I know love Psalms 23 because most people are interested in God's provision and they're interested in God's protection. And so they love Psalms 23. In fact, I've seen Psalms 23 put on bumper stickers. I've seen Psalms 23 placed on coffee mugs. I've seen Psalms 23 placed on t-shirts. But here's the deal. There are a lot of people that have Psalms 23 on their t-shirt, but they don't have Psalms 23 in their heart. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. He says, if you'll obey and you'll act according to my word, then you're my disciples indeed. So here's what I want us to know this morning. Jesus is the good shepherd. I said, Jesus is the good shepherd. Did you know there are people in churches today and they believe that Jesus is the bad shepherd? They're just waiting for Jesus to take out a club and hit them over the head for their sins. But I'm telling you, Jesus is the good shepherd. He's not the beater of the sheep. Now, somebody should say amen to that. You know, recently somebody told me, they said, Pastor, you know, I I just love the Lord. And you've taught us to get up first thing in the morning and spend time reading God's word. And that's what I've been doing. I've been reading God's word at least a chapter or more. And I've been spending some time in prayer. And I know my days go so much better. But, Pastor, I did that for a couple of weeks and things were just so good. But then I had some, life got real busy and I had some emergencies. And I I didn't feel like I had time to read the Bible. I didn't have time to pray. And, Pastor, that's, that's been four weeks now, and I'm ready to get back into to God's presence, but I'm feeling guilty. Pastor, I think God's mad at me. I, I think he's upset at me. I, I've got this sense that I need to grovel. I need to get on my knees and, and just grovel back to him. Everybody look at me. Jesus is the good shepherd. And if you've not been in fellowship with the Lord, you will want to repent for your own conscience sake. But let me say this, God doesn't want you to get on your knees and grovel. God wants you to come running to wide open arms that love and accept and forgive you. Man, I think of the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15. And he's really telling this story. He says, this is what God's like. He says, there was a man that had two sons. And the youngest said, Dad, I want my inheritance and I want it now. I don't want to wait for you to die. And you know, in Jesus' day, the second born got one third of everything his father owned. 
And the father complied. Now, I don't know how he did it. Most of us could not comply. I I bet he had to sell some stock and sell some real estate and sell some cattle. He had to do something to raise some money. But eventually, he got up one-third of the value of his estate, and he gave it to the boy. And Jesus said the boy went to a far country, and he invested it in wild living and prostitutes. And the day came, he spent all his money. He says, you know, even my daddy's servants have it better than I do. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my daddy, say, I'm not worthy to be your son. I'll just serve you as a servant if you'll have me. And the Bible says that the boy made his way back up to his daddy's country and his daddy's house. And while he's still a long way off, the father saw him. Now, everybody look at me. I want you to open your ears. I want you to hear this. You may be a long way off from God, but God the Father is looking for you. The Father is standing at the door. The daddy was looking for him. And the, 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 the dad said, you know what? There's a certain way that boy is walking. He, he looks, he looks like my son and he just kept on looking. Maybe he got some binoculars and he says, you know what? That's my boy. And the daddy took off out the door and he hugged that boy and the boy saying, Oh daddy, he's just groveling. Oh daddy, I don't deserve to be your son anymore. And this father saying, Oh nonsense. And the father turns to a servant. He says, you go get the best robe in our house. You get a ring for his finger. You get some shoes for his feet. You kill the fatted calf. We're going to party. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner than repents than over 99 righteous. See what Jesus was teaching is God the Father likes to party. Now go back into this story with me. Now think for a minute. Why did the boy want his inheritance? He wanted his inheritance because he wanted to do what? He wanted to party. Now, he wanted to sin too, which wasn't good, okay? But he still, he just wanted to go have a good time. What did the father do when the boy came back home? He partied. The boy didn't realize how much he was like his old man all the time. Let me tell you something. God Almighty is partying over you today. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with this. What does that mean, quiet you? It means when you're upset and you're crying and you're distraught and nothing's working, he'll just wrap his arms around you. And quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I'm telling you, God is, doesn't have a big club waiting. He says, oh, I'm just, I'm just, just waiting. I'm going to see if he sins. If he sins, I'm going to hit him hard. No, he says, if he sins, that's going to hurt him. And I want him to repent because I want to hug him. I want to have a party. I want us to have fun together. I believe that if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, see, the Bible says greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The Bible says that when when we come to Christ, your life literally becomes, your body becomes the holy of holies. I believe that right now that God is standing up on the inside of you, and I believe that he's the mighty one that saves, and I believe that he is rejoicing over you right now. I believe that he is singing over you right now. I believe that God, the Holy Holy Spirit is having a party inside you. But see, your mind is so fixed on the problems. Your mind is so fixed on the nasty now and now. Folks, you've got to understand that God is inside you and the one who is inside you is mighty to save. He is mighty to deliver. He is mighty to set free. He is mighty to to comfort you when you're down. He's mighty to heal. He's mighty to show himself faithful. He is mighty to make a way where there doesn't appear to be a way. He's mighty to roll back the waters of the Red Sea. He's mighty to do what only he can do in your life. He's got your back. He's your rear guard. Hallelujah. Jesus is the good shepherd. Somebody say hallelujah. He's the good shepherd. Jesus, speaking about himself in John 10, verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, 
hireling. He was not the shepherd. One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming. And he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. And as the father knows me, even so I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And then we don't have it, but in verse 27, he says, my sheep know my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. Now, folks, we don't have a lot of, we don't raise sheep in this part of the country, do we? I mean, there may be a few people that do, but, but we're, this is cattle country. But I've traveled to some other countries, and I've, and I've spent some time watching shepherds with their sheep. You know, I, I, I was with Brother Bruce McDonald in North Africa, and I watched the shepherds there. And, you know, the shepherds in North Africa are really little boys. They're, they're six, seven, eight, maybe nine years of age. And, and, and there's a group of little boys that'll look after 20 or 25 sheep together. And, and, you know, those little boys, they're probably not the best shepherds because they're boys. They're doing what boys do. They're playing. They're wanting to throw ball. They're, they're picking on each other. They're, they're play fighting. They're doing all kinds of stuff. And, and they're oblivious sometimes to the sheep. And what I've noticed about about those little boys is that one of them will watch the flock for an hour and then a cousin will come and take his place and he'll stay there for an hour and then a brother will come and take his place and then a, another brother. And, and I've noticed that because they're always playing a tag team kind of approach to shepherding, that the sheep never really learn their voice. And when it's time to make the sheep move, sometimes they'll talk to the sheep, but the sheep won't go anywhere. In fact, I've seen those little boys take whips and start whipping those sheep to, to make them go someplace. I, I've seen those little boys take rocks and throw rocks at them. I've seen one time Bruce and I were, 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 were in a car and we were, we were in North Africa close to the Sahara Desert and these little boys had their flock of sheep in the middle of the road. And there are cars trying to come and go, and, and they know that they've created a traffic jam. So they're trying desperately to get those sheep out of the way. And one little boy, he couldn't be more than about seven. He ran, and he kicked one of those sheep in the rear end. I want you to know that sheep got with it. And the, uh, he just kept on kicking them and kicking them and kicking them. But I've also been to the Middle East. And I've watched the shepherds in the Middle East and... Most of the shepherds in the Middle East are adults. Not all of them. There's exceptions to what I'm saying, but most of them are adults. And what I've noticed is there's not three or four men watching a flock of sheep. Sometimes there's just one shepherd, but he's with the sheep. And I, I, I've noticed that when the shepherd lies down on the field, the sheep will lie down too. And I've noticed that when the shepherd gets up, the sheep, they start getting up too. And, and, I, and I've seen the shepherd talk to the sheep. And, and, and I've noticed that when he talks to them and he starts to walk, the sheep will come up and they'll just, they'll, they'll nuzzle up by his leg and rub up against him. They like their shepherd because I bet he, I'm sure the guy smells just like sheep. I bet he wouldn't smell very good, really. But they like that. And I've seen him, I've seen him walk this way and the sheep just start walking. And see, the reason he says he makes me to lie down in green pastures is because sheep, they're not very careful. You know, where they're feeding is where they'll also pollute. And, and they'll pollute a field just about as fast as they'll graze on it. And you gotta keep them moving. You gotta take them to, to greener pastures. And, and, and Jesus knew what it was to be a good shepherd. Can you say amen? amen. Look at verse one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let, let me share with you very quickly three things that I believe that Jesus, who is the consummate good shepherd, that I believe Jesus wants for you in 2017 and for the rest of your life, really. Here we are. Number one, I believe that in 2017, Jesus wants us never to forget that God is our source. Don't ever forget that God is your source. See, when, when I begin to believe that I am my source and I am my resource and I believe that I'm making it because of my smarts and because of my education and because of my experiences, you know, I might get a little ways, but here's the truth. I've got limitations in me and you've got limitations in you. And when I 
face the limitations in me, sometimes I can get downcast. When I look at the limitations in me, sometimes I can think there's no way this is going forward. But dear ones, when I remember that God is my source... I remember the faithful as he that has called me, who will also bring it to pass. I may not know how God's going to work things out, but when I look to heaven and I say, God, you're my source, and God, you are faithful, and I believe in you, he'll make a way where there doesn't appear to be a way, because he knows the end from the beginning, and he's never late, he's rarely early, but he is faithful. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Numbers 13. In Numbers 14, we find the children of Israel at a crossroads because they've got to decide, are we going to depend upon God as our source or are we going to depend upon ourselves as our source? Again, this is Numbers 13 and 14. And Moses chose 12 men, said, I want you to go spy out the land of Canaan. Take 40 days and come back and bring a report. Spy out the land that God is giving to the children of Israel. Everybody say, God is giving. God is giving us this land. Well, they came back after 40 days. We're going to start reading at verse 27 of Numbers 13. Then they told him, told Moses, and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, why would Caleb make that kind of affirmation? It's because he knew that he was not his own source. He knew that God was his source. And God said, I'm going to give you this land. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out saying the land through which we've gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Everybody look at me. The devil and sin have got a scheme. They've got a plan. They want you to have a grasshopper mentality. They want you to think that you're dependent upon yourself and that you don't have what it takes. And they want you to see everybody else is having so much more of their life together than you do. They want you to see everything else as being good except your life. And when we depend upon ourselves, when we depend upon our abilities, dear ones, we're setting ourselves up to have a grasshopper mentality, a negative self-image. Now here's the deal. Joshua and Caleb saw the same walled cities that the other 10 spies saw. They saw the same giants. They saw the same wondrous things in the land and they solve the same problems let me teach you real quickly three things about faith you may want to write these things down number one faith in god is not blind again caleb surveyed the same land as the other spies so faith in god number one is not blind but number two faith in god does not deny the reality of of the problems. Faith in God does not say, oh, that's not really a problem. Faith in God does not deny that there's a mountain there. It doesn't deny that there's a, there's a heartache there or there's sickness or there's a, a problem of any kind. But let me tell you what faith in God does. Faith in God declares the power of God in the face of the problem. Faith in God declares the power of God, the presence of Jesus, the work of the Holy Spirit, the efficacy of the Word of God, faith in God will speak the power of God in the face of the heartache. And at the moment that you're speaking your faith, you probably are not going to feel a Holy Spirit goosebump. You're probably not going to be singing, He's a good, good Father. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. 
You know, you, you, you may even have to, to deal with the spirit of fear or spirit of dread that tries to come upon you. But I'm telling you, faith in God moves the mighty mountains. Faith in God calms the troubled seas. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that that entire generation failed to enter the promised land. In fact, they died in the wilderness over the next 40 years. But guess who got to enter the promised land when they were 80 years of age? Joshua and Caleb. In fact, Caleb said, let me take that mountain. If you'll study carefully the, 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 the 13th chapter of Numbers, you'll find the very first land that the spies went to was Hebron. And that's the very land that Caleb ended up taking. Hallelujah. Here's the second the second truth I want to share with you today, and it's found from Psalms chapter 23, verse 2. It says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And I, I believe that the Good Shepherd wants you to know, He wants you to know that He'll provide rest for your soul. Rest for your soul. What is. What am I talking about? Rest for your soul. The Bible says there remains, therefore, this is Hebrews 4, there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. He's talking about the rest of faith. He's not talking about you taking a year-long vacation. But he says even in the midst of problems, even in the midst of heartache, you and I can enter the rest of faith. Now, David says this. He says, he leads me beside the still waters. Have you ever wondered why David wrote that? What is that about? He leads me beside the still waters. It's because sheep can get kind of jittery sometimes and get nervous. And if they get around wild rushing waters, it upsets them. Not only that, but when sheep try to drink from a, a river or from a, a stream that's, that, that, that's coming toward them. Did you know that the water gets up their nostrils? It's just the way their nostrils are placed on their face. And those sheep will sometimes even drown trying to drink that water. And so what a wise shepherd will do is he'll go over to the stream or she'll go over to the stream and they'll dig out a hollow off the side of the stream where water can pool down inside that hollow. And then that wise shepherd will lead those sheep down. And let them drink out of still waters. Folks, I'm telling you that Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hebrews 4, 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Colossians 3, 15, and let the peace of God rule your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. Isaiah 30 verse 15, in returning and rest you shall be saved and quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Then look with me at verse 3. Psalms 23 verse 3 says, He restores my soul. Everybody say restore. Say it like you mean it. Say it loudly. Restore. Come on. Our Lord Jesus is all about, and this is our third point, He's all about restoration. He wants to restore your relationship to God. He wants to restore your relationship with other people. You know, it was a privilege on Friday night to walk into ICU at Tallahassee Memorial Hospital and to see George Cornwell with a a big smile on his face saying, Pastor, I've been wanting to see you. I've been wanting to talk with you. And I know what they've just told me. They said his, his vital organs, his liver is shut down. His kidneys have shut down. It's just a matter of time. But he's got a big smile. And I said, George, I've been wanting to see you too, my friend. And I said, George, it's time to pray. He says, I know it is, Pastor. And when we pray together, I'm so glad that George repented of his sins. I'm so glad that salvation, we've got a God that is mighty to save. Huh. He saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. Come on. We serve, you serve a Jesus who is mighty to save. And the little nurse that was in there working, 
I kind of think she was a Christian because she just paused and she bowed her head as we prayed. And George prayed for Jesus to forgive him of his sins. And he says, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my master. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Jesus, folks, I'm telling you, our Lord is a restorer. He wants to restore relationship to him. Not only that, but he wants to restore your soul. Folks, you are a three-part being. You've got a physical body and you got a spirit and your spirit is the eternal part of you. Your spirit, you know, see people ask, is your spirit in your, in your head? I really think your spirit is down here. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The King James Version says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And your spirit, man, I think is really down here in your belly and the truth is that some of us have bigger spirits than others right (laughs) thank god for our daniel fast it'll help you work on your (laughs) on your big belly okay somebody asked me oh i know i was talking to sean uh, a couple of weeks ago he says well what do you wear on sunday mornings i said well sean i'm too big to wear skinny jeans (laughs) hallelujah glory to god But when I look in the mirror, I still see a fellow that could wear skinny jeans. Amen? (laughs) Come on. You know what I'm talking about. You got a body and you got a spirit, but then you got a soul. And your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And as we walk the path of life, here's what happens. Sometimes we go through some things and we literally experience the fires of hell torching our soul. And you go from this experience to this experience to this experience to this experience. And hellfire literally will try because the devil has an agenda. His mission statement is kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus' mission statement is I want to give life and give it more abundantly. And so what happens? We go through life and sometimes we we encounter some things. And literally hellfire touches our life. Hellfire touches essentially who we are we get offended and we offend other people we get bitter bitterness is like drinking poison it's drinking poison and hoping the other guy dies but he's never going to die you're the one that's going to be affected by your own bitterness and jesus is the good shepherd he says i want to restore your soul. I want to restore where abuse has brought hellfire in your soul. I want to restore where alcoholism and drug addiction has brought hellfire into your soul. I, I want to restore where sexual immorality has brought hellfire into your soul. And, and let me just talk about that a little bit because I have people ask me, how in the world does my morality affect my soul? Well, folks, the Bible says flee sexual immorality because every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But there's something about sexual sin. It, it touches our soul in a way that it messes up our identity. Again, Paul says flee from sexual immorality. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. He that commits sexual sins sins against himself. That means you're sinning against your very identity. The psalmist asked the question, he said, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And there's some people in this world that because hellfire has touched their soul sometimes at a very young age and they go from this relationship sleeping with this person to sleeping with this person to sleeping with this person and then sleeping with this person and that person and here's what happens it will leave you utterly confused you will not even know who you are because sexual sin sin is a sin against your identity But I'm here to tell you that if hellfire has touched you because of sexual sin, Jesus stands with arms wide open saying, come to me. Come to me. I want to love you. I want to accept you. I want to forgive you. I want to make all things new. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
offenses and grudges will bring hellfire into your own soul. Let me wrap up by reminding you of what happens in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah gets a burden from God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They've been destroyed. For 500 years, Jerusalem's laid in shatters because Nebuchadnezzar and his armies have absolutely destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Some of the walls, some of the stones have been just torn down and some have been torched and some have been carted off to build other things. And God puts it in Nehemiah's heart to rebuild. And Nehemiah and those that rebuilt with him, they, they took 52 days and they rebuilt those walls. Now they had adversaries. Dear ones, if you want to get your soul healed, if you want to get your, 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 he, 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 what does he do to our soul? If you want to get your soul restored, there may be some enemies. There may be some things that will come against you. If you read the book of Nehemiah, you'll find that Tobiah and Sanballat and a whole bunch of people opposed them. And they said, we're going to come and we're going to, we're going to kill all of you. And you know what they did? They said, we're not going to stop our work. We're going to have a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Come on. We're going to have a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other, but we're going to keep on building. I want you to look at me. I want you to hear me. Just as Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, the Holy Ghost wants to rebuild the walls of your life. The Holy Spirit wants to, wants to recreate and restore every place that hellfire has touched your life. When Kathy and I were living in Virginia Beach, and I was in graduate school and also pastoring. We had a a student from Regent University that began attending our church. His first name was Tim. And Tim would come to a Sunday night Bible study that we had going on, and we had a a guy playing the guitar, or it was a girl actually playing the guitar and leading in worship. And I noticed that Tim would cry and weep his way through our worship. He would cry and weep his way through our prayer time. And often we'd just lay hands on Tim. We didn't know what he was going through, but we'd just ask Jesus to bless him because we could tell the Holy Spirit was touching his heart. And after a couple of weeks, I went to Tim. I said, Tim, you got to tell me what's going on with you, buddy. You, 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 when I see you during the day, you seem to be fine, but we get in worship and you just, you just have a meltdown. What's going on? He says, Terrell, all I can tell you is Jesus is healing me from the inside out. And he says, if you've got a moment, I'll tell you a story. He says, I got married right out of high school. And my wife had two little boys. And we moved and I attended Kent State University. And I'm a student at Kent State University. And one day I'm I'm walking to class and this fellow stops me. And he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with me. And I'd never heard this before. And I give my heart to the Lord right there on the campus. He says, and the fellow invited me to come to a Bible study they were having. And so I went and I took my wife and my boys and my wife got saved. He says, and I didn't know what the Bible says. He says, I thought everything they were saying was right on and good. He says, but then the day came, they said, Tim, if you really believe that we're of God, you need to sell everything you have and give it to us. And he says, I didn't know any better. So he says, I did that. He says, they invited my wife and I to move into this great big house where, where there were about 12 people living. And so we moved in with our little boys. And he says, and then one night they said, we've got to go. You see, they had started a carpet cleaning business and they'd gotten letters of credit and lines of credit at local banks. And so they'd borrowed all this money. And then they left in the middle of the night and they, they left everybody just, 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 just holding their paper and, they, they were thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in debt. And they, they left and they said, we've got to go 500 miles away. And they went to another college town. And they would go on campus and they would share the gospel with, with these students. And then they'd invite them to, to these Bible studies. And then they'd say, don't you want to come live with us? And they would get everything that the students owned. And they'd start a carpet cleaning business. And they'd get letters of credit. And they'd say, we're good Christians. And people would say, oh, they're really great people. And... So the bankers would loan them money and in the middle of the night they'd say, we've got to go. And they would just leave everything and leave all the debt behind. And this was a pattern. And Tim said, I knew it wasn't right. So I finally told him, I said, guys, this isn't right. 
And they took me and tied me up and put me in a chair and they began beating me. And he says, and everybody in the, in the group came and they, 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 they took turns putting me down. And he says, I began to believe everything they were saying. And even my own wife, she says, Tim, I'm no longer going to be your wife. In fact, I'm going to be taken up. And she, she pointed to another man in the group. He said, Pastor, I didn't know anything about cults. I didn't know anything about this stuff. He says, we kept doing it. And I kept saying this was wrong. And they kept beating me. And I became their punching bag. And he said, we got to Tacoa, Georgia. Which, how many of you been to Tacoa? Not far from here. 300 miles. We got to Tacoa, Georgia. They started the carpet cleaning business. We rented a great big house. We're all living there. We're, we're, we were sharing the gospel during the day. And some people are coming. And we're inviting them to come and join our merry band. And he says they, they got lines of credit at the local banks and they borrowed all this money. He says, and then the night came, they says, we got to move, we got to leave. And I said, no, this is wrong. He says, and they took me and tied me up, put me in a chair and started beating me and beating me. And my own wife says, you're no longer my husband at all. I don't want anything to do with you. And they beat me and I was bleeding and they left me in that chair and they took off and I didn't know where they went. Two days went by and the owner of the house came by, sensing something was wrong, and found me in that chair and took me to the hospital. They then sent me back up to Michigan to my parents' home. He says, that's been several years ago. And he says, every time I come into these services and we start singing, and that sweet anointing of the Holy Spirit starts ministering to my heart and all I can do is cry because Jesus is restoring my soul. Hallelujah. Look at me. I don't know what you've been through or what you've not been through, but I I want you to hear this scripture that Jesus spoke. And it was spoken by Isaiah originally of the Messiah. It says a bruised bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not break snuff out till he has brought justice to victory and you don't have anything that's gone on in your life that's gone on in your past or that might be going on in your presence that the lord doesn't have an answer for and he will bind up the brokenhearted he'll set at liberty the captive in jesus mighty name i'm happy to say that after about a year tim came to me he says he said pastor terrell god has done such a big work in my heart He married a beautiful girl named Cindy. And though they're adults now, God has brought his two boys back into his life. Because Jesus restores our soul. He's a good, good God. And he's a good shepherd. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. 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 Say it again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, 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 mm. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand. But here's what I ask. Unless you've got an appointment that you've got to get to when you stand, I'm going to ask you just to stay in here with us. I'm going to ask you not to walk around. I'm going to ask you not to talk. I'm just going to ask you to be very reverent because this is a holy, holy time. On the count of three, everybody stand. One, two, three. All over the room. All over the room. I want to talk this morning to three categories of people that are here. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Nobody looking around, nobody talking, nobody moving. I want to talk to three categories of people here today. Some of you today, you've never given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never given your heart to the Lord. And I just want to ask you a question. What would happen if you died today? Would you go to heaven or hell? If you died today, would you go to heaven or hell? I know that I've got some people say, well, pastor, I'm a pretty good person, so I think I'd go to heaven. Unfortunately, God doesn't grade according to our goodness, but he compares us not to other people, but to Jesus. And the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm a whosoever, you're a whosoever. Today, I want to give you an opportunity To say yes to the forgiveness that God offers for your sins. For Jesus to come and live inside you. To make you new on the inside. The second group of people I want to talk to is some of you at one time you'd say I was on fire for God. 
At one time, man, I was just loving Jesus and things were so good, but something happened. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you lost a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter. Maybe you had a financial reversal. Maybe you were betrayed by a friend. Maybe you went through a divorce. Maybe you lost a job. I don't know what happened, but something happened and it caused you to wonder if you could trust God and you cooled off on your relationship with the king. The third group of people I want to talk to today are those that love Jesus with all your heart. But the devil's been lying to you, telling you that you're not really a child of God. You love Jesus. You've asked him to come into your life, but the devil's lying to you, saying you're not really a child of God. And the Holy Spirit is not bearing witness in your heart that you are a child of God. But I want you to know, Romans chapter 8 says the Spirit will bear witness in our heart that we are the sons and daughters of God. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Again, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you say, Terrell, today I need the Lord. I just want you to raise your hand and leave it up until I see it. Come on, just raise your hand all over this room. That's it, sir. Just look me in the eye. Let's just make eye contact. Yes, today. Today. Yes. Back in the back. Just look me in the eye. I see your hand. Just just say, today is my day. That's right. Right here. Right. Today is my day. Today is my day. Somebody else. Anybody else. Just leave your, put your hand up and leave it up until I see it. You say, I need the Lord today. I want to say yes to Jesus today. I want my life to be transformed today. Huh? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else all over this room? Anybody else? I'm going to look into the far left hand side. Everybody over here, this far left hand side, you say, Terrell, I need to get right with God. I want Jesus Christ to be my king. I want him to be my Lord. But you'd raise your hand. Maybe you didn't raise your hand. But you say, now today, Terrell, I know that I need to do this in the stillness of this moment. The Holy Spirit's dealing with my heart. How about in this center section? Anybody at all? Center left-hand section. You say, today is my day. Today I want to say yes to Jesus. Anybody at all? How about the the, the, the center left-hand section? You say, today is my day. I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to say yes to Jesus. How about, how about this center right-hand section? Today is my day. I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to say yes to Jesus. Anybody at all? How about in this, this center section on the right-hand side? Today is my day. I want to say yes to Jesus. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to, you know, hell was not created for people. It was created for the devil and his angels. I want to make heaven my home when this life is over. How about in this far right-hand section? Anybody at all say, Terrell, today I need the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, I'm getting ready to count to three. And when I count to three, I'm going to ask everybody to raise your hand, or even if you didn't raise your hand, but you want to be part of this prayer, I'm going to ask you just to step out and come right down here. One, two, three. Just say to the people next to you, excuse me, I just need to go right down there for a minute. I'll be right back. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just say, excuse me. Excuse me. I want to, I, I want to get things right in my own heart with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Come on. Come on. There are more of you that raised your hand. Come on. This is your day. Don't say, I'll wait for another day. You don't know that you'll get another opportunity. You don't know that you'll have another opportunity. Yes. Come on, sweetheart. Yes. Come. Come on. Come on, I tell you, the angels are rejoicing in heaven today, saints. The angels are rejoicing in heaven today, saints. Hallelujah. Come on. I think there's some more of you. I know there's some more of you that raised your hand. Come on. Even if you you didn't raise your hand, don't say no to the Lord at this moment. Come on. Keep your heart open to Jesus. You don't know when you'll have another opportunity. You don't know when you'll have another chance. We're getting ready to pray a prayer together. Right now, I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say, Lord God. Come on, let's say it. it, Everyone in unison in support of these that are standing here. Say, Lord God. In Jesus' name, I come to you. I ask forgiveness for my sins. I repent. I turn away from my sins. I turn to the shed blood of Christ as the full payment for all of my sins. Come live in me, Holy Spirit. Come change me. Fill me. I say no to the devil. I say no to the flesh. I say no to the world. I say yes to Jesus. 
Work your holiness in me, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Jesus Christ is now my Lord. Say it again. Jesus Christ is now my Lord. Hallelujah. Now, now, look at me, guys. It takes a man, it takes a woman to acknowledge their need of the Lord before people. You say, why did you ask us to come publicly? It's because every person that Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. Now, who the people you came with will wait for you. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and His church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.